but you're just trying to you know find kill all the <laughs> officers and the other and um army so you can get all the swimsuits yeah i remember that part of the war yeah <laughs> You gotta love pseudo World War Two alternate history games. Yeah, like the pseudo World War Two history alternate history that I play every week, where I get to be a bunny lady and go launch my launch myself like a rocket to a essentially a dwarf Nazi in a sniper tower. It's amazing. I, like so I love it. it. I love it. Oh yes. man. Speaking of dwarf Nazis, welcome to this episode of D and I almost said D and D the Tilted Roll Podcast of the Tilted Roll Podcast. Hello everybody. Uh, <laughs> is that a good segue? Yeah, I feel like yeah. Dwarf Nazis. <laughs> dwarf Nazis. We call them I call them at least the fisties. Oh the fisties. Well, because they're like the fists of whatever Schmeier and whatever fantasy babble. Non sequential <laughs> name. Yeah. Uh, but since they're just, uh, to me, it's like, well, okay, whether well, they're the fisties or the fisters, but you know, people take pleasure in, uh, in fisting. So obviously then I got to make it something that is more degrading sounding. So fisties, the fisties, the fisties, that's what I like to call them. Oh man. Today- also, it matches to the Nazi part a little more easily. <laughs> I mean, they're evil, so I don't have to feel bad about killing them. All right. So, but you know, today we're not here to talk about uh, no. dwarf Nazis. Today we're no. here to talk about some exciting news that we received um, some time ago. Now, yeah, it'll, it'll be a little about. while from the point of this coming out. Oh yeah, not to date ourselves right now, but no. let's just say if a certain conference just took place, it just took place. Well, and this was announced before E three. Also um, true. So, but um, we got to just at least have more interviews. With E3, we got more more deets, mm-hmm. uh, not actual gameplay deets, but just you know word of mouth deets. Um, but obviously, we have one place to con- uh, compare it to. But that announcement was Baldur's Gate Three. Yes, it, it's happening. Not Dark Alliance. No, no, it is very different. <laughs> um, no, so actually, that is something I'm really uh, that I am interested though is. Because there was a difference, there was a distinct difference between like the Baldur's Gate games, but then when they went to Dark Alliance, they obviously very much changed the gameplay style, but it kind of yes. befit the hardware they were going to. Right, Dark right. Alliance is a console game, and as a re- mainly, so as a result, they did the you know the normal Baldur's Gate game style does not work on a PlayStation Two or One. <laughs> now it does not, but um, now with three. Uh, they didn't. They just showed the trailer. They didn't show any um, gameplay yet. Yeah, just the cinematic with some eerie mind flareiness. Oh man, yeah, this game is about mind flares, ladies and gentlemen. It's gonna be great. We just saw a guy mm-hmm. get his body morphed into one of these things, which really brings us a question: God damn, can mind flares be even scarier than they are now? Yeah, and that's what's interesting. It's just how kind of like. I mean, that's not a new concept, obviously. No, like no. The, the aspect of you turning into a mind player is a real thing. I, I um, think uh, Chris Perkins on Twitter he actually mentioned that um, in one of the adventures he wrote, he included that into it. It might be someone else, but I think it was Chris Perkins. Yeah, I don't, but yeah, like that's that's an inter- I mean, obviously, it's an interesting concept to explore mm-hmm. um, because the other thing is, especially like you become a mind player. So as a result, you know, obviously, you lose kind of your entire. Uh, really in terms of just self-thought really oh yeah uh for beings that are such great like you know that are mind flayers they're named after the mind and everything they really lack actually a lot of that kind of capability that the mind gives you in terms of like self preser like self-choice right. and preservation instead they went to full-on group think <laughs> <laughs> gotta go into the elder brain the elder brain oh man but uh, this game is gonna be I'm looking forward to this game. You know, honestly, there isn't a terrible amount of like grand adventures that, at least, especially as the video games have been concerned, for like D and D related video games that have really gone into it too far. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always just kind of been there. Like, like for example, DDO I know has done it. I think DDO and um, Neverwinter, the two MMOs for Dungeons and Dragons, have ex- like had DLCs around like or like parts of their stories around. Like the mind flare idea. Oh yeah. But obviously, as MMOs, they're not very story heavy. So as a result, they don't. It's not very intensive. Uh, but and you gotta be careful with mind flares, just because the um, the ever growing and the ever present question of psionics in 
the D and D world, there's always something that's hard to balance. Well, from I was say from both a character stance and an enemy stance, mm-hmm. but in a way, somewhat for overpowered enemies, you can semi. It, it to me, it's a little easier to just like hot fix balance enemies by just not using abilities as a DM. Mm-hmm. Like if you're aware, like this is a cool creature, but this ability is super broken because it's not like character player characters where like there's just this vast amount of ability options you have for like things you can do in a turn monsters usually are a little more limited obviously just for streamlining sake you know if every monster had the amount of options a player character did the dm would just have like books this big like <laughs> there'd be too much detail so obviously like enemies are a little simpler so you can just be like i'm gonna not use this ability oh yeah even <laughs> uh, when it comes to psionics too the mystic uh uh, oh boy! Yeah. yeah, the Mystic class is twenty six pages. Yo, I printed it out. <laughs> it sucked. Yeah, but it's I printed not, it out. It's a it's a real, real. Uh, that's a class. That one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No, going into the trailer a little bit more. Yeah, there's a very real prospect that we might get some spell jamming in this uh, entry. I, I guess potentially. What about it? the trailer kind of leads that eye to you? Uh, because towards the end, uh, when the lightning's you know, striking, you see all those things kind of floating. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of very, uh, you're getting Death Stranding vibes, and that's saying something because no one knows what Death Stranding is about until much, much later this year. Yeah, I was going to say, despite the fact that there was like an 18-minute trailer. <laughs> You try looking at it and seeing like, what's the story about? I've discerned, yeah, no, no, exactly. It's you. You see that trailer and you're like, I've discerned almost no information. All I know is one guy. His name is Die Hard Man, yes. and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kojima. Oh, Kojima. But anyway, yeah. But um, it's, uh, Mads Nicholson aside, um, <laughs> spell jammer. Yeah, spell jammer is just most of the ships back then were shaped kind of like that. They were kind of like squids. Um, and my flingers have been, always been primarily uh, spell jamming, at least in the old AD&D. Well, that and, yeah, because yeah. they, they kind of were like, I mean, they were the basis of like aliens, essentially, in, in the game. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, they essentially come from another planet and then and like they're they're just meant to like bleed in the idea of like alien <laughs> technology. And obviously a number of parts of spell jammer is like a setting and whatnot kind of deal with these potential space travel aspect right. um so obviously it is potentially a a place it could go and it's i'm very excited to see if it does go that way if not still uh, the potential of a um a mind flare epidemic going on in Baldur's gate is something yeah still very interesting it's still very interesting and very it would be very cool to play as i'm also very curious to see if they uh, what they do with like character creation if they do go that route. Well, so this kind of is a good transition. That's a good yeah. transition point. Yeah. yeah. Hello. <laughs> it's almost like we have notes, even though we don't. <laughs> um, no. So what <laughs> the people, the people who are making uh, Baldur's Gate three mm-hmm. um, are the same team that made the, both of the divinity original sin games and divinity original sin two uh, got a huge amount of praise for being a very, almost just like D and D based game that, you know, stays very true to kind of a gameplay style that D and D is really known for, but then translates it translates it well to a video game. And even then, like the game actually had like a tool for like map building that people would just use as virtual tabletops for like <laughs> games. Like it was actually like that game was actually crazy for what it could do as in terms of like RPG standpoints, especially like relating to a D and D like game. Yeah. So for me. That gives me a huge amount of confidence going into Baldur's Gate 3. Um, obviously, they could cave under certain pressure because obviously it does add a lot more to pressure to like be now you like, it, you know, when you make a game and it's supposed to be D&D like, um, but, you know, it's not actually D&D, you know, if it doesn't necessarily link up to the idea of what D&D is and, yeah, you know, like, oh, yeah. yeah. You maybe failed at that, but you still, it's your own game. It doesn't matter as long as the game is fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. now that you are attached to Wizards and D&D, oh, now there's a little <laughs> bit more pressure, you know, and we'll see maybe if that changes at all. But I have way more confidence with them kind of making this game. Because, mm-hmm. sure, will it be like Baldur's Gate 1 and 2? No, but 
it's going to be pretty close. Like the way that they've modernized that system of gameplay is astonishing. I just really hope they bring back Manx and Boo. <laughs> you, you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Big tall ranger guy with his his giant miniature space hamster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who in terms of like what like they ever they kind of tie into the other ones, it's really kind of a who knows. Because, I mean, like, there's, there's, like, a 20-year gap between Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 mm-hmm. and now 3. Oh, my God. I, I just remembered they're re-releasing Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 for the consoles. They are. Um, yeah. That's a good – That's and that'll be – I mean, obviously, that'll be really good for people. What's interesting to me is that – so, obviously, or what a lot of people probably don't remember – is that Baldur's Gate one and two were made by Bioware, right? And that was that was those were the games they made pretty much just before they made Knights of the Old Republic. Like they went from Bald, they pretty much just went right from Baldur's Gate to Knights of the Old Republic, and that's why Kotor is just like so, like D and D, like just to a T. Like it's just got so many D and D aspects to it. Feet building is pretty much just like. D and D one well, that I tried to avoid the microphone and I somehow went into it. <laughs> Sorry, um, but yeah, no, like they they like were really good at putting it like putting D and D right into Kotor, and it's obviously because they were obviously the the games that they were making up to that point were just D and D games. They were Baldur's Gate one and two, um, but that's the thing. So like obviously they they started to change their game making style, and then Baldur's Gate eventually kind of shifted to different developers and went into the dark alliance kind of type of game Mm -hmm. and so now they're kind of taking that main step into um going right into the actual like just or kind of a in a way it's kind of taking the step back to uh normal Baldur's gate style but with that modern flair the divinity kind of gave it oh yeah and uh, speaking of Baldur's gate Mm -hmm. speaking of which um, let's not forget that there was a new book announced as well. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so speaking, yeah, it's in yeah. the Baldur's <laughs> Gate uh, realm, uh, which was it was well, kind of. I'll just pull up the base uh, title here mm-hmm. and the, the store page of it. Uh, but there's yes, Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus. Oh man, the the descent, the um entire three day events that uh, Wizards of the Coast put out turned out to be. Uh, based off of this book, which is Baldur's Gate: Descent into Avernus, in the second series or the third, I guess, sec- the third entry of books with a city name in the beginning, because we had Wa- Waterdeep, Dragon Heights, and then Waterdeep, mm-hmm. uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and now we have Baldur's Gate: Descent mm-hmm. into Avernus, where we are literally going to hell. Yes. Uh, what's cool about it is that it is like since it's one through thir- levels one through thirteen. It definitely kind of fits a really wide range. So, like, if you want to play this with, like, like this is a great one to play with, um, you know, pretty much, like, if you want to, like, if you're going to have, like, if you know you're going to have, like, a pretty consistent group, mm-hmm. but they're pretty new, throw do this adventure. It's, oh, yeah. like, the, any adventures that are, like, 1 through 13 that are, like, really long, like, because, like, what's, well, the ones that are shorter, they're really better for doing, like, ones that you obviously, like, maybe don't meet up too often or you know like say you kind of perf- you don't like doing online so you just meet in person but you can't meet up all the time those the shorter ones are really good for that but like these long ones are really good for when you have like consistent groups you know either online or offline and just like constantly playing with like just being able to consistently play with a group and you can just play for a long time because obviously you don't have to worry about pacing you can you can kind of know how long certain things are likely gonna take especially depending on how much your group you know that's true and let's not forget the fact that this book introduces hell mo hell cars pretty much hell cars because <laughs> in the descent they explore this and they, they're like it's more of a mad max uh sort of deal um here uh ever ever the, 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 the first layer of hell <laughs> the first layer of hell is that they have uh, mad max style cars inside of it fueled by souls by the way you deal with souls in this game and you get these special things called soul coins which apparently give you uh could give you one of multiple things according to what the dm prefers like it could give you a vantage it could 
uh, you can ask them a quick thing and you can make a quick deal. Yeah, which... It's almost like an inspiration that you could hold forever and never use. Exactly. Who but, would do that? <laughs> but I also am interested to see the ties. <laughs> interested to see the ties between this book and Rise of Tiamat because both of them kind of deal with the same, with um with denizens of the first layer of hell, which yeah. is Tiamat and then Avernus. Yeah. Well, or, it, well, not Avernus. It was Ariel. Yeah. Well, and then and obviously like yeah, because Tiamat's a, and Tiamat's a very interesting like realm to think about with that stuff because mm-hmm. of just. Um, I think with a kind of how important Tiamat is, but it's such an iconic figure. Obviously, they went with that kind of they they tried to bring Tiamat into the fold early on. Oh man, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I I yeah. instantly just thought about the uh, the cartoon series <laughs> where they fought Tiamat. Come Tiamat! <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh my god! They just brought out a... <laughs> just like right away. It's like the first episode. And like a hundred percent, it's like the first episode. Tiamat comes out. It's like they beat. They're like level one, and they essentially beat Tiamat. Something's wrong here. Like I know you want to start strong on the pilot, but that's uh, (laughs) Mm. to be fair, Tiamat was also level one. I guess at that time, baby Tiamat. It it was. It was. Um. It was that old. But no, this book is just. It's very interesting. Uh, My my first campaign dealt with uh, devils and demons, and this is that and i love it so much Mm -hmm. i can't wait to see because it also lets you use the um options in modern kinds about the blood war and and cult packs and well because that's really kind of i mean the blood war is essentially like going on at the time of this setting Mm -hmm. you know so like that's really why it like so it kind of becomes so like that inclusiveness is really there oh yeah well is, is because of the how important they are so gith are coming into the fold, people. Oh yeah, and and to be fair, the blood war has been going on ever. It's it's right. it's a constantly a uh, constant thing, but now we get to see it in front of us, and it's great. Yeah, because like the way Mortar Canyons talks about it, it's very almost kind of like in the past type mm-hmm. of like terminology. But no, it's going on right now. If we were in D and D universe, well, yeah, but it's like it doesn't hit the material plane in as many of the adventures, like really. Um, like there may be some, there may be some like references and stuff or like things that spill over, but Mm -hmm. it's not inherently like happening in the material plane all the time. And like every single adventure, like all of the adventures kind of are generally don't mention it too much, except for this one. Except for this (laughs) This one. This one's going to be like, it's everything. (laughs) It's getting real deep. (laughs) And something I'm very excited about too, is the fact that the first level of hell, Arvaris, is run by the fallen angel, uh, Zariel, who is now an archdevil. And according to our boy, Mr. James Hick, Mr. James Hick, um, there's a very real chance you might be able to redeem her. And I'm always for those storylines. So Except just... if you're a number of the parties that we have played with in the past no. who will just straight up go to kill him right away. Right. <laughs> we have... Even when it's too early. <laughs> Is it bad that we, every, that most of our campaigns um, were, were motor ho- essentially murder hobos? Kind of. Or we um, don't care enough for it? No, yeah. I mean, luckily with the ones that we've done in shows, we really haven't had to worry about that as much. Right. Um, like the people that are kind of attached to the natural one campaigns have either been, I would say more timid to do that type of thing or, you know, obviously are like me and you were like, we are very focused. We're very story focused. Yep. So because of that, we're not really always going to be like, I must immediately go to attack. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it is kind of a difference. Um, it, it's so potentially, Depending on certain people you play with, you'll see, you'll find out oh, yeah. if you're gonna avenge her or not, or is that out of avenge? But you know what I mean, redeemer. <laughs> but another thing we've heard from this game is the fact that I I don't remember, or not this game, this book. I don't remember which one's coming first, uh, but w- either the game or the book is a prequel to the other. Just, well, definitely, this is coming out first. Baldur's Gate three isn't coming out until twenty twenty. That's true. So I think this, so a descent into Avernus would set up everything for Baldur's Gate, which will make sense because it might be a very real case that the 
uh, first level, this first level of how, see the Hungarian accent just comes out. And <laughs> no, just but it stops is interesting that they they announced this, but there was no potential idea that a Baldur's Gate game was really coming back. I think there was minor rumors, but mm-hmm. um, it was just kind of like, oh, wow, this makes sense. <laughs> but, but, it's a book. Now there's a game. This is a really good year for D and D. I lie. mean, it's if we're we're in a huge like renaissance of it. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's so much bigger than like I think you could have potentially expected it to be, uh, compared to like where it was in like the in like the two thousands, right? So like definitely in like the nineties, uh, it's very interesting, and it's I, I think in a way Wizards has done a very good job at kind of keeping the helping keep the brand alive, which I think is really important. Especially for the reason that they got it in the first place. <laughs> like, essentially, just like, here, please keep my dad's legacy alive. Take the game. <laughs> and they think, I think, obviously, I think they did a pretty good job with that. Um, okay. I think overall, they I, I can't be too disappointed because it still exists when it easily could have just been thrown away. That's true. Uh, and, so, definitely, I think they've done a good job overall. <laughs> Oh man! And then other than that, they also released um, a mobile game, uh, Wizards of the Coast. I had to bring it up to uh, to remember the name of it. Uh, Ludia is the one that made it. Warriors of Waterdeep. Uh, it's a pretty standard game. You just uh, you pick one of eight heroes to be in your party, um, four at a time, and then you just go through these dungeons. And it's actually a lot of fun. It's got a few kinks here and there, and like one chest that won't let you. It's, open it completely so you're just kind of stuck there forever <laughs> um but it was a lot of fun i, I enjoy that it because it's got a lot of notable names um as the heroes uh, from books and the de- uh established in the lore um I well, want- uh, yep i was gonna say we're well, getting back to to books here yes uh we've got one right here oh we do uh that we should that we should talk about because now yeah. that it exists you only want to talk about it because it's special edition. Because you want to. Here's here's the flex. So, oh yeah. Oh yeah. No flex. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Just right over my face. <laughs> you can stay there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, no. So yes, Ghost of Saltmarsh uh, released obviously like a number of weeks ago at this point. Oh yeah. Um, but we really haven't been able to talk about it too much. But now that, especially now that we've been able to actually look at it. Um, to me, it's very interesting the way it is because it's it's not what I kind of thought it would be in a way. Like I very much – I was expecting a little more – I mean it does a good job at like showcasing like how to do better for na- naval combat and like some of those. Like uh, like kind of – it has like good some good baseline things. Right, the, like they exist. I'm, ve- I'm very happy for this book. The reason why I'm leaning my head on Marshall's shoulder right now is because I want to – showcased how excited i am that this book came out because for one for one someone is running a naval campaign between the two of us and take a guess who that is <laughs> so guess this book saved my life a couple of times uh when i was planning for that campaign and two one of the backgrounds is marine and that that just tickles me in the right way <laughs> yes however i feel like it's in a semi different type of at least just like like I feel like their purpose is slightly different. <laughs> it is, but the minute um, the minute I saw that, I sent a picture to all the guys I knew who cared about it, and they they <laughs> they had they were very 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 happy about that. So we were there, and then the adventure itself, the adventures that are yeah, that take I place call in it an adventure. It's yeah. just more of multiple adventures. It's kind of like just having your own like. Like this is like one off the book. Yes. Like really, in terms of like the between like like between I would say chapters two and yeah two and, between chapters two and eight, um like those those chapters are all just like their own secluded one off adventures. And sure, if you wanted to find a way to weave them all together and, mm-hmm. and you know sure like in a campaign, you could do that. But it's in a way it's like so in a way like. Sorry, I'm kind of <laughs> mixed between how I feel about a, the book as a package. Okay. Just because, like, I don't know. For me, it's a little weird where, like, you know, you pay, like, you know, this book has, I mean, this is the special version. So, obviously, I think it's $30 for, like, the regular version. Well, like, online, yeah. What was the re- cost of the regular version? $30. Oh, still was and the like, same? If, if you buy the physical copy at a store, 
It's fifty. It's fifty dollars all throughout. Well, um, no, some books are less. Uh, some of the adventure books are like ten dollars less. Oh, um, uh, Sword because Coast. They're not very. No, that's like twenty dollars less. <laughs> That's like way less. Like I, some of them are, some of them are just less because of the of still a lack of content. Um, but, um, still like the yeah, but yeah. Um, sorry, I'm getting lost now. I've lost my train of thought. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. But no, that's and but that's that's kind of part of it to me though. You are paying like full, you almost like source book price instead of like advent like some adventure books are a little less right um but you're paying like full source book price for kind of something that i don't feel like is maybe like the most complete package um like it's almost like parts of the book for like kind of like it has like so many different uses it's very hard for me to find it as like this like super like useful complete thing <laughs> to like use like for an extended period of time Unless you just kind of find the way to make them all work together. That's true. I mean, yeah. But um, in a weird way, it is like we mentioned before when we were first talking about it some podcasts ago. It's it's like Tales of the Yoni Portal. It's just a bunch of one-off adventures that can all be taking place in the one portal. It's, this has the added benefit of having um, some mechanics thrown into it about ship mm -hmm. warfare. Now we have official ship rules of how that works. We have some ships to use and to uh, use as, as examples to make our own. Uh, we also have some more backgrounds, a few more magical items, and some monsters. Especially the monsters. There are some some pretty terrific monsters in there now. Um, yeah, I definitely looked at those uh, for, you know, potential... Uh, potential party murdering. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you and me both. Because I'm looking at them and I'm looking at the baby Kraken. Ah, yes, the baby Kraken. Yeah, it's the baby Kraken. Uh, I'm th looking at that, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe that one. Yeah, but that's, so I guess, though, that's kind of the thing. It's just, like, it, it's it's one of those things where it's, like, it's semi, I guess, just, like, a point of almost, like, weird identity to where it's just, like, <laughs> it's, like, both an adventure book, but it, like, wants to have some, like, almost source book material in it. Yes. And so because it's neither of those things, it's, it's like both because it's both of those things mm -hmm. it it makes it feel like it's lacking in certain other areas like the adventures don't feel super enticing but then it doesn't feel like it has enough information to warrant just getting it for like the magical items or the new monsters or anything like that <laughs> um so i think that's what makes it semi a little more difficult uh just to kind of think of as like super complete package uh because like if you think of something like and like because obviously like one of the biggest things that they have kind of neglected to match up to, I think, in terms of a book as a whole, mm -hmm. is you know, or uh, is Xanathar's. You know, oh, like yeah. that was because that was such an amazing package for the price that it was. Like, <laughs> you know, it was. I mean, sure, it's it's full source book cost, but it still is like a really amazing like secondary book. Uh, which, by the way, have they made uh, Xanathar's like a, a one of like the books you don't have to use as your plus one? Uh, anymore no it's still your plus one i thought they were like planning someone was telling me that they were like supposedly planning on like changing that so it didn't have to be one of your plus ones i think as of right now if well you, i think it still is but it, i wasn't sure if they plan if they made any announcements yeah by changing that by the way we're talking about adventures league because eventually yeah. you have the player's handbook plus one other source book or adventure book that you can use mm -hmm. um as far as I know, I, um, I think you can get around it by using DM rewards. If you DM a certain amount of hours and you get that much points, and then you can be like, yeah, here we go. Or you complete a certain amount of book or something. Yeah. Like, um, By the way, there, there are changes going on in Adventures League, too, with the new with um, Avernus coming out. But I don't know any of that yet. That might be the topic of a future yeah, podcast. Well, that's, yeah, that's what we'll have to kind of see how that goes. With oh, yeah. Because the, like, they did that. I mean, they made the change. The last time they did an update was with Waterdeep. Oh, yeah. So since we're kind of at a new, like, uh, city one, they yeah. seem to really be pushing that. It's seemingly the, the seasons are supposedly matched with the cities in the last two. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I do, I do, what I do think is if they kind of put more, if they kind of allow this... What this is, though, is it is a very good AL book. Yes. Like, if you're an AL person, like, runner or, like, yeah, if you, like, run AL a lot or you have a DM that runs AL a lot, like, this book then would be very good. Like, I would say this is a great value if you do, like, AL. 
Yes. Like if you like playing on AL, it this is then is a great value because <laughs> the fact that they are segmented then is perfect for you. Right. Because you don't need to make a connecting point. You just have to play them whenever you need you want to. It's just like here's the job you've been given. Exactly. And then that's your way in. All right, cool. Wait, wait, I think um this year we are getting one type of source book and that's like acquisitions incorporated. Yeah. And that's gonna be our only one for the year. And that's what I wonder though, because like I feel like oh there's gonna be I feel like depending on how that actually ends up being, mm-hmm. I feel like there are going to be a lot of people that are semi disappointed by that. Because it does feel like you know, because it's not like because it's attached to a essentially a third party show. Right. In a way. So because of that I feel like there's gonna be a lot of people who because they don't watch Acquisitions Incorporated, they're not gonna think of it like a Xanathar's, you know, like another Xanathar's type book. Right. You know, because, like, I'm fine with them not making, like, 600 players' handbooks and, like, complete mage, complete warrior, complete whatever, blah, 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 like, all of those. I'm fine with them only making, like, a couple at a time and then just bundling a bunch of stuff together. Right. But, like, at some point, I feel like that ha- does kind of have to happen. Artificer's got to come out from something. And we'll Stop f- teasing us with it, wizards. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. I know it. Make it official. Yeah, Jeremy, we're looking right at you because we know this is your baby. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't. That's what I wonder, though. It's like I wonder if they're like, because like that's the thing. It's like I don't think they're gonna come out with Mystic anytime soon. But do they want to release another class just by itself, or do they want to do more than one class? Because I would think a better book value would and more would make a book more enticing to get is if it had the multiple new classes. Or it just should have a large number, a decent number of subclasses for the other ones. If it's just going to have the one class mm-hmm. add, then it should have, like, I would say, like, potentially, like, almost two per two per class. More importantly, make more interesting wizard subclasses that aren't restricted to elves. <laughs> I like playing elves, but blade singing is not, like, the most enticing pl- class on the planet. And it's only exclusive to elves. Sometimes I want to play a tiefling. You know, it's like, so it's like, okay, cool. I mean, well, at that point, it's just a matter of uh, asking your DM, hey, can you just not have this be elves? I mean, I know, but I'm just saying, like, in terms of a general standpoint. Yeah. Like, because say you were playing AL and you, Xanathar's was your plus one. So, or if it's not even, say Sword Coast was your plus one. Don't do that. But, <laughs> but I mean, you say, can. Say Sword Coast was your plus one, right? And you wanted to do blade singing, but you didn't want to be an elf. You wanted to be your favorite class, the halfling. You know, like then you're SOL. You know, it's so that you can't, and you can't do that. You can't, that one, you have to follow the rule. You, that's not a, just a DM change. Oh, yeah, so no, it that's was what more eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Like, because like War Mage was okay, but like, I feel like n- it's very hard for me to think of like every single school subclass that Wizard has. As being like the most interesting class subclasses ever compared to like the others, <laughs> it's it's very wizard. I feel like is of like a strange class, and I think that's why I haven't been able to like attach to it super hard. Right. Yeah. So, and that's kind of I think always the one thing is I feel like every time I get a book, I always want some type of like one, like one, like kind of like how Ravnica was. Right. Like it didn't have. It was a. It was definitely like a, like just environment book essentially like it was just about ravnica and that yeah. was it campaign but, setting yeah but then thank you uh but then they had they just added the order and spores so i was like okay we've got two subclasses just thrown in there and i actually don't mind that and i kind of wish they would they would almost kind of utilize that a little bit more in the adventure books i feel mm-hmm. like in a way that would make them slightly more enticing outside of just like new magic items <laughs> Like, yay, there's new magic items in this book. <laughs> I mean, what they, this one did benefit, though, with the fact was the naval combat. Like, oh, yeah. that's the difference. But I just mean other ones would benefit from it. Like, if they had some type of thing. Like, if, say, if Curse of Strahd had, like, a race you could, like, a, like a different race or sub-race. Like, a, variant, a human variant for, like, Dampier or, like, Vampire Spawn. You know, like, it just would be interesting if, like, more adventures, I feel like, did something like that. Um, it didn't even have to be class. It could be just any any type of character option, but like one, just at least, like just one, because you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But it would make I feel like the adventures themselves right. way more enticing to get if you're somebody like kind of us, who pretty much just generally do homebrewy style campaigns. 
you know, I feel like we're not in necessarily the minority for sure. No, no. I feel like it was kind of a good mix of both. And because of that, it would just kind of, I feel like if people like us, it would, A, it would make them more money. <laughs> but yeah. B, it would give us more reason <laughs> to get the adventure books. Because I definitely don't own much of any of these. And I don't plan on buying them all either. Um, the only uh-huh. one I, I feel like I still plan to get just for certain, I feel like certain aspects of what are in it um, is the Curse of Strahd. But still, even then, like, I just, like, there's the way that they, I feel like they could be more enticing to get, you know? <laughs> I have no right to say anything. The only books I do not have is Rise of Tiamat and Princess of Apocalypse. All right, right. Okay, in terms of your <laughs> physical books, you did w- like waste every uh, ounce of your like um, marine checks on <laughs> on books. Yeah, not even like a novel. These <laughs> no, those yeah, and also other books. But yeah, but yeah, you did get novels, but yeah, <laughs> yes, because we did a lot of reading back then when you're doing nothing. Yeah, you get, you don't get a, you don't get your switch. No, no, but it kind of taken it. But yes, but other than that. I think yeah. I think we're good for that podcast. Yeah, that that'll do it. It got a little like w- w- kind of went everywhere a it little did. bit. But hey, most podcasts uh, do, and I like it. But yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Uh, tune in next time for what we ramble about next. Uh, hopefully, more details about Baldur's Gate three. If not, it might be Marshall talking about Fantasy Star Online too. By the way, Fantasy Star Online 2 is coming to America in 2020. See, what did I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as always, my name is Francisco. I am Marshall. And we'll talk to you guys later.